And we'll dive right in, beginning with a huge day legally for Donald Trump. He is expected to be in a New York courtroom this morning for a hearing on the hush money case against him. The trial was supposed to start today, but it was delayed earlier this month after federal prosecutors turned over thousands of documents, which the Manhattan District Attorney's Office says are largely irrelevant to the case. The judge is now expected to set a new start date for the criminal trial. Meanwhile, today is also the deadline for Trump to put up a bond of nearly half a billion dollars in the civil fraud case. The bond would prevent the New York Attorney General from collecting on the judgment while he appeals. Trump's attorneys have asked an appellate court to reduce, delay or waive the bond. But as The Washington Post reports, the appeals court generally issues rulings on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So there is very little chance it will act today. So, uh, Chuck Rosenberg, what, what should we be expecting this week? How significant will it be for the former president? Well, it could be very significant if the attorney general of the state of New York, Joe, begins to move against his assets. Uh, but let me add a note here, if I may. Uh, just because a prosecutor can do something doesn't necessarily mean that she should do something. Well, we know that Mr. Trump has asked an appellate court to either reduce or waive uh, the bond that he would have to pay. Well, we may have a decision from that appellate court soon. Uh, it might be prudent in this case for the attorney general to wait to see what the appellate court says before she starts moving against the assets. You know, uh, again, prosecutors have a lot of authority and a lot of power, but you don't always have to use it at its fullest in every case, in every instance just because you can. And so if I were the attorney general here, I'd like to hear what the appellate court has to say about the amount of the bond and whether they're going to reduce it. Because you can always move against the assets on Tuesday or Thursday or Monday of next week. Uh, and it might make sense uh, to wait and see. Uh, Jonathan O'Meara, obviously, this is a massive bond um, and, and ob obviously makes a bad situation much worse for Donald Trump, uh, but there was also, and man, I don't, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how his Truth Social uh, deal is going the way it is, but uh, it, it looks like a Ponzi scheme to me. I don't, I, but I don't, I don't understand it. This is, though, a social media network that doesn't appear to be successful, and yet people are throwing around five billion dollars here, five billion dollars there. Does that provide Donald Trump uh, an economic lifeline uh, in the short term? Yeah, well, first of all, there's certainly nothing's going to be able to materialize by today. It, you're right about Truth Social. It's a website that, frankly, no one uses. Uh, it has very little traction outside of the extreme MAGA right, and it is where Trump continues uh, to post since he was kicked off of Twitter after January 6th. I believe he's only posted one thing since, which was his mugshot uh, when he was indicted in Georgia last summer. So he's still trying to drive interest to Truth Social. It's not really working. Uh, there have been you know, merger deals you know, rumored for a couple of years yeah, now. They all but, kind but, of but, fell so apart. Where, where does this massive valuation come from? I'm, 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 it's it's a, all over again. It is a... <laughs> In, in, in a free and open and fair market, I mean, if you're just talking about economic considerations, who would invest in this company unless you were trying to curry favor with somebody you th think might be the next president of the United States? Well, I think you hit it right there. It's someone trying to curry favor with the next, them when they believe the next president of the United States. Um, you know, we certainly have seen a number of people do that of late. And, and this is one with True Social where it's not. It's not a success by any measure. But yet, there seems to be money coming, or at least it could, it's not done. But there's rumors of money coming there that could really change Trump's financial picture. Now, it wouldn't be coming in the next few weeks. It wouldn't be an, it, arrive in time to stave off this Bond. So this is still an issue, a separate issue for Trump, but it could come down the road. It could allow him to reset his financial footing. And, and you know, there's also talk about what will happen today. Is this going to lead to Trump to declaring bankruptcy, uh, which, of course, is a tool he's used before? And that won't get him out of, experts say, that won't get him out of having to pay this judgment, but it could delay things. Now, it would be a, a black eye politically for a, a former businessman who touts himself as a master of the corporate universe. It's part of his, his deal when you're trying 
trying to when he's making his pitch for the presidency. But that could, if he does that, that could buy him some time. And maybe, Joe Mika, this financial lifeline for True Social or another one would emerge. Joining us now, former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin from outside the courthouse in New York City. Federal criminal defense attorney, attorney Caroline Polisi joins us as well. She's a lecturer at Columbia Law School and MSNBC political analyst Elise Jordan is with us as well. Uh, Lisa, we'll start with you. Uh, tell us what you expect to hear today, what you'll be looking for. Well, Mika, one of the things I'm really looking for is how quickly Judge Juan Mershon gets to the question of when this trial is going to take place. Because former President Trump's motion here wasn't just for an adjournment. It was for a dismissal of the entire indictment on the theory that because the Southern District of New York, an arm of the Department of Justice, responded to his subpoena with documents that he had never before been provided, that that somehow is proof positive that the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has engaged in what would be called discovery misconduct. And as a result of that, the whole case should go. I don't expect the judge to have much tolerance for that argument, but depending on how long that argument goes, that should tell you how seriously he's taking it or whether he cuts it to the quick and we have a real quick and dirty argument about when this trial should start, Mika. All right, Caroline Polisi, same question to you. What will you be looking for? And also, in terms of the bond issue, uh, since you have some specialty in regulatory investigations and commercial litigation, I'm curious if it, if it gives you any insight into what the best option for Trump would be in terms of making that bond. Yeah, so, so first question uh, on, on the trial today with Judge Marchand. Um, barring the unlikely scenario that there is sort of a, a smoking gun um, information document in what I'm, I'm going to call in, in the federal system we call Brady material, which is um, information that the defendant is sort of constitutionally, um, you know, bound to receive by the prosecution, I think this is going to be a blip on the radar screen. I don't think Judge Marchand is going to kick the trial date back past, you know, mid, mid-April, where, where, where it's uh, scheduled to now. Um, I think that, you know, there are uh, reasons to have this hearing. You know, the defense, as a defense attorney, you can't just sort of take the government's word for it that, you know, here are tens of thousands of documents, but only about 270 of them are relevant. And by the way, we think the overwhelming majority is uh, inculpatory, meaning duplicative of the information we've already uh, given you. So I do think Judge Mar Sean does need to get to the bottom of this. This argument that the SDNY and the AG's uh, DA's office was somehow colluding is, is laughable if you sort of know the history of those two offices' uh, relationships. The Southern District of New York notoriously does sort of not play well in the sandbox with other prosecutorial bodies. And so the idea that they yeah. would be colluding with, um, you know, Alvin Bragg's office is, is sort of laughable. None, nonetheless, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, on the bond issue, you know, I know you played the clip about about the potential for uh, Trump filing for bankruptcy. I'm sort of of the camp that that is just, will, will never happen. Um, you know, savvy yeah. commercial litigators and sort of, um, you know, people that are in the business understand that filing for bankruptcy is, is not sort of um, what it sort of colloquially means and that, uh, you know, sometimes it can be an important thing to do. And in a vacuum, maybe uh, I would say to do that in this case for the bond, but Trump's just, you know, never going to uh, file for bankruptcy. I think he'll be able to cobble together the he bond. Has before. Yeah, he certainly he has before. But of course, now he's in the middle of a presidential campaign. Um, so, Lisa, a couple things to you. Uh, first, let's just say this, the trial does get a go ahead where you were in today and it does happen in April. How long do you think that trial will last? And, you know, will we get a verdict uh, ahead of voters um, going to the polls? And, and let's get your, your sense here. If that money, the bond doesn't appear, do you think the attorney general of the state of New York, Mr. James, is going to start seizing his assets in the days ahead? Well, let's start with the trial, John. So the district attorney has told Judge Mershon that he expects the trial to last four to six weeks, and that's inclusive of jury selection. However, having attended three Trump trials in the last 12 months alone, I can tell you that these things 
always take longer because his attorneys are specialists in the Trump MO, which is delay, delay, delay. So I do expect that we would have a verdict, for example, before the political conventions. But do I expect that the trial will last four to six weeks necessarily? No. Let's go back to the bomb, though, because Caroline said something that I really want to amplify about bankruptcy. There are other reasons that I think Trump won't file for bankruptcy beyond his own pride. One of them is if he were to declare bankruptcy, there is a likelihood that he would plunge many of his existing loan agreements into default. And the amount that his lenders could collect if there were events of default under his outstanding lending agreements could be far in excess of the totality of what the attorney general's office believes is necessary for a bond. But there's one other reason, and that's the concept of joint and several liability. So I hate to take our viewers to law school right now, but the judgment that Judge Arthur and Goran entered with respect to that civil fraud case holds Trump and a number of business entities jointly and severally liable for the judgment. And what that essentially means is that Trump can't escape that judgment simply by putting a number of business entities into bankruptcy, nor can he escape by putting himself into personal bankruptcy. He would have to do both of them at once to halt any further litigation and enforcement efforts. And if you think Donald Trump is both going to declare himself personally bankrupt and then have a number of entities subsidiary to the Trump organization and the Trump organization itself in bankruptcy, I think you've got another thing coming. My suspicion is that he will cobble together money from a variety of sources to post a bond, but it won't necessarily be today. And that also means that although Tish James can start some enforcement efforts as soon as today or even soon sooner, really, there was nothing stopping her. That doesn't mean that a few days from now, we won't see Trump post a bond to stay enforcement of that judgment as he sees the judgment through the appeal. Michael Elise here. What is the historical parallel, the closest parallel to a politician who is this embroiled in legal problems in the run up to an election? What can you can you think of any? Is there any history <laughs> guidepost <laughs> that can uh, nothing <sighs> I can give you the shortest answer on earth? Nothing at all. Uh, when have we seen, especially uh, not only former president, a presidential candidate, putative nominee in court this way? And the other thing is that, you know, presidents in history, we elect them because they've been a success in their profession. I was I'm mentioning Washington Lincoln. General Grant won the war, uh, the Civil War, or uh, did a lot to help us win the Civil War. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower led forces on D-Day. <clears throat> if Dwight Eisenhower had failed on D-Day and, D -Day and those forces had been turned back and they'd go back into the sea, do you think that he would have had a prayer of being elected in 1952? So Donald Trump this week is going to be shown as essentially a fraud. This was never a successful businessman, someone who does not obey the law, uh, someone who will not support the Constitution. As I was saying earlier, and more important than that, look at his record as president. Two things, and I'll just say these. Number one, our security and that of our children, we Americans, is protected by an elaborate system of alliances uh, Joe, you and Mika have talked about it a lot, beginning with NATO. Donald Trump has said, yes. elect me president again. I will vandalize NATO, and under certain circumstances, I'll tell Putin, do whatever the hell you want. Direct quote. And the other thing may be just as important. A president is supposed to protect our lives. Four years ago this month, the horrible COVID pandemic began. How well did Donald Trump do in telling Americans how to protect themselves, in mobilizing the forces of the federal government to be frank about the danger that was here, how people could find some way to make sure that we survive this thing? You know, I leave it to you. You know, I think all this year, day after day, we should say, what was Donald Trump doing uh, four years ago today to avert exactly. one, million, uh, one million deaths didn't happen? You know, <clears throat> Joe, listening to Michael Beschloss and everybody else here in the panel today talking about the myriad of issues and the weight of the problems, <clears throat> financial and political, that Donald Trump carries each and every day, I'm just thinking that we have been carrying this fugitive from justice in our history literally for over three decades before he even became a real public figure appearing on The Apprentice and running and winning the presidency of the United States. And I used to think I had some sort of an answer, 
that he, you know, was a master of uh, focusing in on people's anger and resentment about things around their lives, and that's one of the reasons he won. I no longer have an answer to it. I mean, he's been around and survived all of these incredible, weighty legal and political issues, and he's still here, still here, still a free man. I have no explanation for this, Joe. What do you think? <laughs> well, you know, um, while you were talking, I just thought about something that Barack Obama said. Um, Elise, and I thought it was really insightful of him when he was running for president. He said something along the lines of, when people see me, they hold up a mirror and they see themselves, like the possibilities for themselves, the possibilities for being an American, the possibilities of, 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 of doing things that you couldn't do in, in many other countries. I wonder if this is the other side of that mirror and a mirror of resentment when, you know, the thing that has, the thing that has confounded us from, from the very beginning in 2015, I always talk about uh, Mark Halpern and John Heilman had a focus group, something you know a lot about. And there was a New Hampshire woman with tattoos uh, who, who was a, a blue collar worker. And uh, Mark Halpern asked, uh, why do you support Donald Trump? And her answer was, because he's one of us. He's not. He's never been, <laughs> never will be. Uh, if he was uh, one of us, he would be in jail right now, like all the people from January the 6th. But he's been protected. So I wonder, again, is... Is the vote for Donald Trump less about Donald Trump and more about the rejection of elites over the past 50, 60 years? Joe, you nailed it. That's all it is about at the end of the day. And it's what Donald Trump has done so masterfully, fully by he's made the grievances that he has, the grievances that people have against him, it's not about him, he tells his voters, it's about you. They are doing this to you. I am being persecuted. They're not doing this to me. They're doing this to you. And by pushing the victimhood narrative, he has managed to make this not just about himself and his problems of the day, but about a large swath of the country that is repulsed, frankly, by elites who are sitting in Washington and they feel like dictating their lives and looking down on them. So he's just he's able to market that in a way unlike any other modern politician. Which is why, Mika, I know this sounds crazy, but yeah. everything about what's happened since 2015 politically has been crazy. Donald Trump declaring bankruptcy may be the best move for him, not just economically, but politically. For anybody, for anybody out there who thinks Donald Trump having to, to file for bankruptcy because of a massive uh, judgment against him, they think that will hurt him with his base. They haven't been paying attention over the past seven years because it would not it would hurt his pride. I don't think he'll do it because of his pride. But the base if Donald Trump had to commit, uh, had, had to uh, file bankruptcy. I actually think it would help him politically. I, do, I think it would, too. And it would drag it out um, and he could use it. And um, the one of us term, it, it's so interesting because to answer Barnacle's question in a number of different ways, um, he inflated his assets in every way. Uh, he pretended to be the New Hampshire woman, one of us, I connect with you, mm -hmm. but he was also aspirational. Everybody, yeah. you know, dreamed to wear the red hat and be rich and famous and have gold plated everything. He symbolized success in that way. And a lot of Americans who were really struggling day to day with their bills, yeah. absolutely uh, felt aspirational in Donald Trump. So right, right. but you know the, the the thing is though, Jonathan Lemire, being in politics, I I have and doing the job I've done and interviewing people, I've met a lot of rich people in my life. I've met a lot of billionaires. I've met a lot of self-made billionaires. One of us, 
I can understand it. Like, I could, I could name you 10 extraordinary stories. I know you could, too, of people who were born with nothing, who worked around the clocks. A lot of people who didn't, didn't go to college. They just worked, 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 worked. And, and they, were, they are American success stories. What's what, so crazy on this one, this one of us thing? Donald Trump inherited the equivalent of $400 million, lost it all. I mean, he, he's, he's not one of them, never was one of them, which is why this whole one of us argument is confounding. You know, I think it was Tom Wicker that had a book uh, about Richard Nixon called One of Us. Nixon was. And Nixon was born, uh, you know, in, in, a, in a struggling family, just like Reagan. You could talk about Carter there. A lot of presidents, Gerald Ford, that grew up, uh, Bill Clinton, that grew up uh, and could say, hey, I'm one of you. I grew up like you. I understand what you're going through with your family. Joe Biden, my God, more than better than anybody else right now, understands what people go through when they struggle. Not Donald Trump. Mm -mm. That's where this whole one of us storyline just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, but we've been living with it for nearly a decade now. This is a man who's got a skyscraper on Fifth Avenue with his name emblazoned in gold on the side, and he lives in a penthouse there. And yet, and yet, and I saw this when I was on the campaign trail in 2016, and you still hear it today, there are people out there who are very different from him, you know, from places, whether it's Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Florida, wherever it might be, who say, this guy gets me. He understands. And some of that is because he gives voice to to grievance. He gives voice to that feeling of, I hear you, you've been left behind. It is a rebellion against the elites. And I think we lose, we don't want to lose sight of how powerful that was in 2016, coming not long after the financial meltdown, coming not that long after the Middle Eastern wars, coming not long after, frankly, the election of a black man as president, which cannot be overstated there. So many white mm -hmm. working class Americans felt like, hey, this country's changing. It's breaking away from me. This guy will bring it back. And then you add that to this culture of just celebrity uh, and victimhood that has created since. And it's still a potent political mix. Partisanship sometimes matters. There are also shared principles, shared, that help maintain this remarkable democracy and make us one people under the rule of law. It's a kind of miracle when you sit there and see all those people in front of you, you, you uh, the people that are so different in what they think, and yet they've decided to help solve their major differences under law. And when the students get too cynical, I say, go, go look at what happens in countries that don't do that. And that's there. I can't take this around in my job. But people have come to accept this Constitution, and they've come to accept the importance of a rule of law. That was former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer on the importance of the rule of law. Justice Breyer, who was nominated to the court by President Clinton in 1994, served on the bench for 28 years before stepping down in 2022. He is out now with a new book entitled Reading the Constitution, Why I Chose Pragmatism, Not Textualism. And the former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer joins us now right here on Morning Joe. It's good to have you, sir. Justice Breyer, thank you so much for being here. Uh, tell us why this book is so important uh, at this moment in U.S. history. I think it's important because many Americans are uh, discussing the court. Uh, some approve it. Many do not approve what it's been doing recently. And then they have reasons as to why they think it's doing what they don't like. Uh, one of them is they think it's politics, and I don't think it is. I think it plays a very minor role in politics, at least politics as it's ordinarily understood. Others think that they just like to do this this way or that way, and, and that's not a very good explanation. Now, in 40 years on the bench, which I've had, 28 on the Supreme Court, I've gotten more or less used to the basic job, which is to take words in a statute or the Constitution words typically that don't explain themselves and decide how they apply in the case or what they mean. Now, I think the thing that has changed over the last decade, over the last few years, 
is a method of deciding that has become very popular. And that's called textualism. And it's so attractive. It says all you do is read the words. Just read the words and do what they say. And this will be simple, clear, and it will stop judges from deciding what they think is good instead of the law. All right? Many believe that. Mm -hmm. I do not. And there is another more traditional way of looking at those words. And that is, someone wrote them. What was their purpose? What are their consequences? How do they fit within the values that underlie this document? I still have it, the Constitution of the United States. And will they last, these interpretations, to the point where they make the lives of people in the United States better? That's what I call pragmatism, but it's much more complex than that. And so I want to explain to people what I've seen, not as a professor, not as a theory. Those professors do know those theories, but I've had some experience that they've not had. And that's the experience I want to write from. I want to tell you about this case, that case, the other case, and why that fits into a pattern and why I think Rather than just blaming politics, lawyers and non-lawyers, people in the United States and others, should wake up, in my view, to what's going on with what sounds awfully academic. And it isn't, because it determines how those cases will come out and affect men and women in America. You know, it's so it, it, it's such an extraordinarily important book right now, especially, as you said, for people, for Americans that look at court decisions, say, well, it's just political. Yeah, you, you can look at the makeup of, of any court. You can look at it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not shocked by Dobbs because of what Clarence Thomas, because of what Kavanaugh, because of Justice Kavanaugh. What, what, what they've said throughout most of their lives. And I, I think it, it, it brings up an important point. If we're going to have this debate and understand what really moves it, yes, sometimes politics enters into the hearts and the minds of men and they try to just, but this is the battle to win, isn't it? This is, it yes. is, it is, it uh, is the intellectual battle that has to be won. It is a battle to win. And I think that the, uh, it's not that the judges you name or other judges are just sitting there thinking, oh, well, I have a different point of view. If we're interested, in my opinion, of running, not running, the risk of certain dangers to the republic that the founders set up, we don't want to run those risks. And therefore, I think the path which not too many people outside the judiciary will see, but I see it and I want to explain it. The path called textualism is something that should be avoided. Simple? <laughs> Simple? I'll tell you something. I just read an opinion. I just read an opinion where it was 63 pages long, sent 30 pages each side, and you know what it was about? It was about what the word and meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are others wow. like that. And if you think they're simple, if you think the cases in the Supreme Court in the language are simple, so you can just go read them and see what they mean. I have a bridge in New York to sell you. Justice, you're arguing for pragmatism in law and in reading of the law. And on the court, you were surrounded by a lot of justices who were strong originalists. How did you balance that your beliefs and their beliefs? And what is the right balance between textualism and pragmatism? It's a very good question because it is a question that Justice Nino Scalia, who was a good friend of mine, and I would debate. And we would debate it uh, usually before students who went to Lubbock, Texas. I think there were about a thousand students there. I was amazed. They must have thought it was a basketball game. But the, the uh, uh, and we spoke about it. And uh, because he very much is a textualist, uh, it is written that we should just follow the words basically and no more. And uh, I would say to him, you know, life changes. And the values that are in the Constitution, they have to be adapted. So I said, 
you know, he's a very intelligent and very funny and amusing guy. So I said, George Washington didn't know about the Internet. And he said, I knew that. <laughs> and he said, but the problem between your system, it's like the two campers. I said, who are the two campers? And he said, uh, one sees the other putting on some running shoes. Why? There's a bear in the camp. A bear in the camp. You can't outrun a bear. Yes, he says, but I can outrun you. <laughs> and that's what Scalia says. He says, Stephen, you have a system and you draw on a system because this system has been around since John Marshall, since the founders. I didn't make it up. <laughs> but the, uh, he says, uh, it's too complicated. You're the only one who can work it. And I say, Nino, I don't think that's so. But if it were so, you have a system that will produce a constitution and a set of laws that no one will want. Justice Breyer, <clears throat> as you know, uh, this country <clears throat> is on the edge of something historic happening in the court. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't pay attention to the court every day, but a lot of people of influence certainly do. And there's an element called pace of play that I would use that phrase to describe what might be going on here at the court. We had Nixon and the Watergate uh, papers. We've had Bush Gore. Those decisions came down from the court fairly rapidly in terms of the court's usual pace. But now the court seems to be slowing down things, slowing down things, and slowing down things. Is there any rational explanation for the amount of time being taken to make these decisions? Well, I don't have the, that experience that you describe. I mean, in the 28 years, uh, it's much more uh, mechanical in the sense of taking cases or not than you have just described. My experience is when a case is ready, it comes there. Why do we take a case? We take a case because normally different judges, lower court judges in different places have come to different conclusions about the same question of federal law. I can give you an example of a federal question that could be. Do you want an example? Yeah. Okay. This is not, I won't give it an American example. I'll give a French example because I read it in a French newspaper. Okay. <laughs> and I'm teaching to the fifth grade. And I say, look at this example. What? A biology professor is traveling from Nantes to Paris to meet his class with a basket, and in that basket are 20 live snails. The conductor comes up, what's in the basket? He shows him. Do you have a ticket for the snails? He says, I need a ticket for the snails? That's ridiculous. He says, read the fair book. It says, no animals on the train except in a basket, and if so, half fair. This is not applying to cats. That's dogs, maybe a rabbit. Certainly not a snail. You think a mosquito? <laughs> well, that's ridiculous. He says, is a snail an animal? Aha. Uh -huh. Mm-hmm. And I put to the fifth grade class, what do you think? Do they have to pay the fare or do they not have to pay the fare? And before you know it, they are fighting with each other like mad. What about a scorpion? What about, oh, is it an animal? Okay. Now I say you understand the job of the appellate judge. <laughs> it might really not be good. a snail. It might be uh, bare arms. But that's the job. And the question is how you carry it out. And when mechanically the rules of procedure when that case is before us and we decide to take it, four votes will take it. They then start to write briefs. Who? The parties, the government, the friends of this party, the friends of that party. And they're all called briefs. They're little documents. Do you know why they're called briefs? Because they're not. Yeah, exactly. That's it. They're the least brief thing I've ever seen. All right. But we read them. And then we have an oral argument. Then we go into the conference. We discuss it. Nobody else is there. And people say what they think. And don't say, ah. as you've learned, ha ha, I have a better argument than you. That will get you nowhere. Listen. That's what Senator Kennedy told me and the other staff members when I worked there in the Senate. Listen to what people who disagree with you say. And when you listen and discuss, you sometimes find agreement, some agreement. We can work with that. And we'll work with it and try to come closer to an agreement or compromise. And then 
We go out, and the chief assigns, and we write an opinion, and we circulate it when it's ready, and people can add, if they want, concurrences, dissents, and finally everyone's exhausted or written, and uh, <laughs> they're finished, and the opinion comes out. That's it. And there isn't mucking around with dates, very little, very little. You can never say never about anything, but very, very little. It proceeds in so the mechanical way. All right, breaking news. The president and CEO of Boeing, David Calhoun, and several other senior leaders are resigning. This after the company has come under scrutiny. Amid concerns over the safety of its planes, regulators began increasing calls for changes after a door plug blew out of an Alaska Airlines plane in January. Calhoun says he'll step down at the end of the year. He was appointed to the position back in 2019 after Boeing ousted its previous chief executive for his handling of the aftermath of two deadly 737 MAX Mike, crashes. Mike Warnica, what in the hell has happened to Boeing? I mean, the FBI has actually reached out, uh, according to breaking news over the weekend, they've reached out to people that were on that Alaskan Airlines flight and said they may be victims of, 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 of a crime. Yeah. Uh, and, you, you know, it's it. that's not the only wow. incident. It's, it seems one after another after another. There is... There is such a quality control problem at Boeing. It, it's it's stunning how bad it is. Yeah, I don't know the answer to your to your initial question, Joe, but I do know that Dave Calhoun was one of Jack Welch's key personnel in terms of management. And Dave Calhoun was a widely pursued CEO. I believe he was CEO of a couple of different companies earlier, you know, before he took the Boeing job. Uh, and he was noted for his management skills, and clearly he was brought in by Boeing to correct the, uh, the, the mishaps that had occurred at Boeing over a period of time. He's been CEO of Boeing, I think, for five or six years. <clears throat> this is a surprise, uh, yeah. but it's not unexpected given what happened. I mean, the, the Boeing has had the, the plane crashes, they've had the doors blown off, uh, they have multiple, clearly, personnel issues, but... Uh, it's another great American company that is not so yeah. great anymore. A new book is sounding the alarm on the current mental health crisis facing youth in our country and what we can do about it. In The Anxious, Anxious Generation, author and social psychologist Jonathan Haidt spells out how Gen Z, those born after 1995, were the first to come of age bombarded by the alternative use of social media, staring them in the face 24-7 through their smartphones. The toll this way of life has taken on their well-being has been devastating. A new study by the Kaiser Family Foundation reveals roughly one in five adolescents report experiencing symptoms of anxiety or depression. But Hyde argues there are ways to fix this. And she, he joins us now. This is such an important book. Thank you for writing it. Um, I, I have kids in this category mm -hmm. and I see through the eyes of them and many of their friends and Joe's kids exactly what you're saying. I would like to add um, school shootings to this, which has become a way of life now for young children. And I wonder if that also, you agree, plays a role in this generation of anxiety. Um, well, uh, thanks so much for having, having me on. It's a big mystery because it, it's hitting all of us, and everyone has a theory about what causes it. And, and fear of school shootings is one that I, I hear a lot, and the Newtown shooting was 2012. But that doesn't explain why the exact same thing happened, a complete collapse of mental health hitting especially girls yeah. and especially young girls in Canada the UK, Australia, oh. New Zealand, it all mm -hmm. starts around 2013. And that's not because of American school mm -hmm. shootings. So mm -hmm. uh, when this first broke out, we weren't sure. But now that we know it's international, there is only one explanation. There is no other theory that can make sense of a, of a synchronized global collapse in mental health, other than the fact that in 2010, the great majority of kids had a flip phone, no high-speed right. internet, no uh, unlimited data, no Instagram, and by 2015, they all have a smartphone, high-speed internet, unlimited data, Instagram, front-facing camera. So what I'm arguing in the book yep. is that childhood was rewired in those five years. 
Well, and also parents, teachers, communities lost control of the narrative of what children are exposed to when. So if you can imagine young kids with phones, with the Internet, exposing them to all sorts of things that were definitely not, you know, a, a, a mm -hmm. tap away uh, before that. And mm -hmm. that would include porn That's right. um, and, and hate and also a sense of inclusion or exclusion. They knew where everybody was and the, the communication and the exposure would go mm -hmm. all night long. I mean, it seems so obvious. And at the same time, Jonathan, it doesn't really feel like anything is being done about it collectively. Mm -hmm. I will That's read right. about a school system or a community that is trying to ban smartphones in schools. That's not gonna solve the problem. Well, actually, that would make an enormous, enormous difference. It, it so, would start. It would start, but then they pick the phones up after school. Okay. So, so Mika, what I'm hearing from you is what I hear from most parents and most teachers, <laughs> which is it's a hell of a problem. It's ruining everything. We're losing control. But what are you going to do? The problem's too big. Oh. It'll, we'll never solve it. It's resignation. That's what I keep hearing. But what I argue in the book is that we're stuck because it's a series of collective action problems. That is, why do you feel you have to give your kid a smartphone in fifth or sixth grade? Because everybody else did. Why does she have to have Instagram right. in seventh grade? Because she's the only one who will be left out if you don't let her have it. So what I'm arguing in the book is once we see this, we parents, ah. we're, not, we're not getting much help from Congress. Congress created the problem. They've done nothing since 1998 to, to regulate it. Um, we parents and teachers, we can solve this if we act together. And so what I propose mm -hmm. in the book is four norms that will be the foundation for a complete reform for rolling back the phone-based childhood. And the four norms briefly are no smartphone till high school, no social media till 16, phone-free schools all day long, not just during class, and a lot more independence, free play, and responsibility in the real world. If we do those four things, they're hard to do as a lone person, but if we do them collectively, they get easy. So, I love Jonathan, it. all of this, I love, I love the fact that you're giving guidelines because every parent like me is looking for them. I have an 18 year old whose daughter, she's the youngest of my four, and she's completely grown up with the, the smartphone. But interestingly, just in the last few months, she's deleted all social media apps from her phone. And a group of her mm. friends are doing the same because they're finding that it was taking up too much time, it was causing too much anxiety, etc. And I just wonder, where, are we starting to see? Are there glimmers of those who are perhaps older than 15, 16 yes. starting to say, wow, this is, we, we have to do something about this because our parents aren't, our teachers aren't, That's our right. members of Congress aren't, and actually they're sort of done with it. Absolutely. This is actually a big reason for hope. Gen Z has a lot of problems. Their anxiety is making them less effective in the real world. They're not as ambitious. They're not making as much progress. But they are completely not in denial. They see the situation very clearly. And over and over again, they say, they say if we could all get rid of it at the same time, we would do it. And we are starting to see individual and, and clusters of friends moving to flip phones, which are much less toxic than smartphones. So this is the amazing thing, is that almost everybody wants to change, even, even the teenagers. They want to change. Um, there was a review in, the, in a British paper. The reporter ended by asking her 18-year-old daughter, would you have liked a smartphone ban to age 16 when you were younger? And the daughter says, would it apply to everyone? And when the mother said yes, she said, Yes, I would have rather liked that. And the mother was so yeah. sad because it was such a missed opportunity. You know